Guilford, how are you? Hey. Hey, how's it going? It's going. It's going. Good. Hello, everybody. So, Gilford, you haven't like started recording yet, right? You're, like we're still waiting. Meeting. Thanks, Go. Gilford. Pursuant to Governor Baker's March 12, 2020 order suspending certain provisions of the open meeting law, this meeting of the TAC, uh, Amherst TAC, is being conducted by a remote participation. Um, right. so this meeting is uh, um, August 4th meeting is officially called to order. Um, are there any public comments? Um, all right, so we have eight of us, and I guess we have another person. So, oh. um, so Tade Coleman, he's in the audience. He is a new grad student at UMass, um, and I'm happy with him if he wants to come in or if he wants to. I told him we invited people to our meetings, so I'm sure he'll be good. <laughs> And he actually told me that he had applied to join the TAC. So how about that? Hello. Hi, Tate. Hello. Hello. Nice to meet you. So thank you for joining us. Um, I don't see, do we have any, we don't have any old meeting minutes to approve. No, right? I hadn't seen okay. anything from Amber. That's fine. We'll get them next time. Um, and so the first order of business on our agenda is an update on the Lincoln Avenue sure. parking. And that's you. So I can give that update. And if Guilford has anything more to add. Um, so after our last, right at our last TAC meeting, we went through the proposal for Lincoln's parking um, that had been submitted by Councillor Jennifer Taub, who lives on Lincoln. And, and then we had our recommendations and I wrote them up and I sent them around for comment, which came very kindly, um, edited, edited my document to make it sound so much better and compiled people's comments and thank you everyone who weighed in. Um, and then I submitted that document to TA I submitted that document to TSO and I presented it at their July 21st meeting. Um, that item took up, there were a number of other items on the agenda. So we basically went through and we answered a number of questions. Um, I did get the sense that most of the counselors there were, um, they were persuaded by the safety arguments that we had put forth and that had been put forth previously in the memo that the town manager had written a few years earlier, which had the recommendations based on input from the DPW, the fire chief, the police chief and so on about the safety concerns on Lincoln and um, they led with that. And so they decided that they would use the tax memo as the basis for what they would notice for the public hearing as potential um, changes for the parking on Lincoln. Under the town council, they do need to have a public hearing whenever there's gonna be changes on parking on street. And um, so that all went pretty well. Um, and then I wasn't there and so at that time, the TSO kindly after I presented, there were some questions about that we had said that the town should revisit the restrictions after three to six months, you know, after the new dorms at the corner of Mass Ave and Lincoln are open. Um, those dorms will have eight, over 830 beds between grad students, uh, mainly undergrads and some grad students. Um, and you massively calculates that about 0.5 bed um, parking spaces per bed. So UMass will be providing 400 parking spaces for that new dorm, but only 100 of them are on site um, at close to those new dorms and others will be elsewhere on campus. As somebody who works on campus, and I know Tate's now a grad student, sometimes parking can be pretty far away <laughs> from where you would like it to be. Um, so there were some questions about whether it was appropriate to wait that long. You know, I just and I just said that I thought that we were we want to be and some people said too, why aren't we more restrictive on sunset or why aren't we more restrictive in other areas? Um, but I thought that 
it was good for us not to be too I mean, I'd really like to see something I'd like to see it get approved by the council. So I didn't want to be go too far in restricting direction. It can always be revisited anytime the council TSO thinks. Um, and there were some interesting thoughts like so Andy Steinberg, he also brought forth the idea about he he asked whether you could have a sign as you enter a neighborhood because one of the main issues with all the on-street parking on lincoln is how close people park to the driveways and how that limits the sight lines um and sometimes are even like into the driveway area and so andy steinberg asked if you could have signage like when you enter the neighborhood that just says you know you're not allowed to park in your driveways but then i said well it's possible that a lot of neighborhoods could ask for signs like that so <laughs> i don't know I mean, so um, that was going to be investigated, like with the police chief who wasn't present at the meeting. Um, and later in the meeting, during the actual public comment, so right after that short discussion, the TSO did kindly take public comment both for Jennifer Top, who had brought forth a proposal, as well as a resident who lives on Sunset. Um, and at the but and then I left the meeting went off on life. But at the end of the meeting, there was a public comment period at the end and um, there was a resident who lives on Dana Place who walks on Lincoln to campus often. And sometimes he parks on Lincoln and he argued as he has argued in the Gazette and the Amherst Bulletin and other forums that all the parking on Lincoln should be free and that we owe it to, you know, that it's very classist and it's hurting working people from UMass and students from UMass if we don't. And that's his point of view and that's what he said and he's also been on other social media lately like making those same arguments i mean to me that argument i feel like his argument he he works at umass so he could park at umass but he feels like he's giving umass a pass and saying umass as a public institution doesn't have that responsibility just speaking for myself and so i don't know why he thinks that amherst the town has that responsibility and umass doesn't so anyway but I'm sure we will hear from him again. Was and, there um, any, oh, sorry. Go ahead. I was just curious if there was any thought to actually making the parking restrictions 24 hour. There was some, I mean, there was some consideration on that too. I mean, some of the but, counselors were advocating for that. I was just curious because I mean, you know, the concern was about driving, uh, parking close to driveways and all this right. stuff. Right. Which in the middle of the day, yeah, sure. But then at night as well that could be i mean there hasn't been yeah know. there hasn't been that demand like i mean again I, we don't know if it will change right but typically like if you go on lincoln now like there's hardly any on-street parking and if you go on lincoln on the weekends there's any on -street. i mean it's very tied to like the yeah. monday through friday campus hours and so if that changes they can revisit that i know that mm -hmm. Councilor Todd has already reached out to a number of the neighbors in that area, and some of them have said they would be fine with like complete restriction. But mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but it can be really not convenient for people who live in that neighbor, you know, or who visit or whatever. So I don't know. Go right. for but comments. At the same time, you know, yeah, so. what's good for the goose should be good for the gander, sort of thing, right? If you're complaining about one thing, we need to make sure it's safe all the time. Right. But I if think the demand right. isn't there, then it's not an issue. Yeah. But the, if the demand is only there certain times, I don't know. Guilford, comments? We're, we're taking bets that it'll be pretty much parked up the whole school year, 24 hours a day. Why? Well, do you, do you know where one of the, the park, one of the, the only parking lot we know of that they're working on, actually two parking lots they're working on on campus. One's down behind the Mullen Center next to the central steam plant. Mm -hmm. And the other one is over by Olympia Apartments, Olympia Drive. So there really is going to be no extra parking except on street parking in that whole neighborhood. So when students move in and we don't have a winter parking ban that says get off the street at midnight, you're going to have people parking their car continuously on that, those streets in that area. So that's our, that's what um, we're running down our little, we keep, we kind of have informal pools that go on all the year for a soda so that's what's in that one. Oh, oh so, so you think you think if there are no restrictions that it will people will just park there because because that did happen over at the end of last school year 
people were parking there all the time during the week at least. So has this, I mean, I've never attended any of those meetings, like the town gown meetings, you know, with, um, have there been discussions about the parking demand on Lincoln and, or just the area? No. I'm not allowed to attend I, those meetings either. I have not been to them either. I know counselors go to them. <laughs> okay. Well, yeah, I mean, it can always, the council can decide they need to do more too, so. Anyway, but it's moving forward. Um, they did, the TSO is gonna wait to have its public hearing until September when the students are back, which will present some evidence already, even without the new dorms of what that looks like. Um, and I've heard tentatively it's scheduled for September 15th, but I don't think that's confirmed yet. And people are wel welcome to attend. And then um, TSO is gonna be taking up this item briefly on August 18th just to finalize the notice for the public hearing. I can't attend that meeting if anybody would like to be there just to, you know, say whatever the tack, I might if be anything to... comes. Okay, thanks Kim. Or if any, you know, if anybody else wanted to be there and just chime in, chime in if something comes up. I mean, they did vote last time, but you never know how it's gonna go. Yeah. And perhaps the same person from Dana Place will show up again or whatever. So. Yeah. Never know. Okay, um, all right. Yeah, so the uh, the next agenda item is yep. an update on Safe Route to School. Sure. Is that Chris? Yeah, so uh, Chris and I can talk about that. Chris, did you wanna talk first or? Go ahead, Tracy. Okay, so I'll just launch. So, um, so we have been in communication with the district and Chris and I met with the Safe Route to School coordinator for Western Mass, Lucy Freeman Bell last week. Um, we are planning to have a kickoff event with the school district on the school district's back to school day, like the day before the first day of school, which will be on Wednesday. School will be starting on Thursday, um, August 25th, and it will be on Wednesday, August 24th. Um, just a table and they have that event. They usually have had it in the past, like pre-COVID, they had it on the common, right, where they have the school buses and different speakers and all this stuff. And they're going to be doing it at Kendrick Park this year. Oh. Um, so Lucy, the Safe Routes to School coordinator will be there. Chris will be there the whole time. I'll be there part of the time. Um, you know, so we'll have a table. We will be doing surveys to kind of get more feedback. I know that um, Deb Westmoreland from the district sent out a Google survey towards the end of the year just to get feedback from people about if this is important to them and if anybody wants to volunteer. So we'll be following up on that. Um, and just hopefully getting people excited. The tentative plan is um, Lucy and Chris have a meeting next week with the, now is it not? Yeah, next week with the principals um, to follow up on the earlier meeting we had at the beginning of the summer, just about trying to actually launch some promotional activities in the schools like walking school buses and things like that. We're talking about doing um, like a walking Wednesday you know, starting in October, where there'd be a different school like highlighted each Wednesday. Um, and I believe like Wednesday, the second Wednesday in October, it's usually the first, but this year it's Yom Kippur. So the second Wednesday, which is October 12th, um, is, is like International Walk, Bike and Roll to School Day and maybe doing some events around that. Uh, so we're just taking it easy with the school. and. Um, Chris and I had also worked on, before school got out in the spring, we went and we did observational counts about how many people were walking and biking to the school, which I've talked about before. And um, we took lots of pictures. So Chris has been working on just a summary report for each school. And she has the one for Fort River to show. We could walk through it and see what feedback we have. Um, and then I also have just a kind of, I mean, it's set up as a slideshow, which I really like because we have a lot of pictures. We have more pictures we could add. Um, but then I also just have a summary document of just a few pages sort of outlining what we saw overall, you know, what we saw as the key issues and potential next steps, which I'd like to get the um, tax feedback on it, you know, at this meeting to the extent possible, and then maybe afterward, and then just send it to the district, like by the time of the meeting next week if people have any feedback, so, okay. 
So Chris, do you want to go through yours? I'll just, first? Add, that, I'll just add that Lucy and I are meeting. So it, Deb Westmoreland is the one who's facilitating next week. It's not just Lucy and I with. Right. Principals. And the prince and the principals yeah. and assistant principals and the like facilities director and things like that, right? Maybe. Yeah, maybe was a little and from the police department, maybe. <laughs> so okay. Yeah, I'm traveling then, so I probably won't be at it. But okay. So Chris, do you want to show your slides? Um, I actually don't really know how to do this. All right, I can do it too. Um all right. I probably yeah so um Chris shared it on Google Docs I can send around a link I know Guilford said after the last meeting he doesn't use Google Docs which is fine I can also send like a copy um and if we make any changes I can help with those we can just make those edits in real time and then send Guilford a later version so this is sort of the model it was built it was based on what um I'll just pull it up right now it was based on what um Safe Reach to School does with their walk audits. Um, it's that was more like that. a picture, a picture. Yeah, audit. it's, yeah, but it's great. I mean, it's nice and I write lots of text, but you know, nobody wants to read it. So let's do that. Okay, so here I'm gonna share. Um, and people can, you know, interrupt us at any time. So Chris, can you see, can you see it? And yeah. Okay. So do you want you want to walk through it and you can just tell yeah us. so just to be clear, I mean the main audience for this document is the principals themselves and Deb and Mike Morris and Randy Sibley in the transportation department. Um, that's who the main audience is. So this really isn't some document that we expect to be circulating around. Um, it's more just to collect everybody's feedback and stay on point as to what we think the major, um, you know, the major things that are going on as far as um, safe routes to school is concerned. So Chris, I did give you like slide control. I think you should be able to advance it yourself. Okay, so where do I do that? Um, go under view options. I don't know, or can you just hit like control to like, or like, you know, um, whatever like the arrows or whatever to advance it oh yeah that. maybe i mean i just advanced this one but <laughs> i didn't it said i asked if it gave you control and I, it did if that works Sorry, but, yeah that's otherwise not okay that's all right we'll just advance okay so this is fort river um we uh counted um a total of five cyclists and six walkers on the day that we were doing our um our kind of visual count. And they all came from the Main Street intersection, Main, Northeast, Southeast, and Pelham Road. None, nobody came from anywhere else. Um, we do not have what we are getting, the number of kids who have a W next to their name. <laughs> so that's the um, number of kids who live within a mile and a half radius of the school and theoretically with a W next to their names means they could walk um, or bike to school. Right, so uh, I do, uh, I do uh, think that that excludes like people who live on roads that are considered dangerous to walk and, and also like people with disabilities or other reasons that they can't walk, but. Is that uh, as the crow flies? Yeah. So a mile and a half as the well, crow flies? Actually, that's yeah. a good is it? It's yeah, not no, like it's, walking it's, routes? It's around a radius. So I'm supposed Oh, interesting. There yeah. are internal maps being made by Randy Sibley, oh. who is the transportation person for the school district. And he's just doing circular maps. Um, a half mile, a mile, a mile and a half. And we're just going to try to dot it out and capture um, based on last year's um, addresses. And again, that's that's not at all for public consumption, but just to take a look at um, where the neighborhoods are that are sort of pockets and groupings of students. Well, and some of that information is available for any students who are eligible to take the bus, which as we have found out, it includes students within the one and a half miles, you know, if they're along a bus route. Yeah. That you can tell from the bus route, like 
lists, right? Because it says on the elementary school level, it actually lists like each house and like how many people at each house, how many students at each house. So. Right, right. Yeah, that's true. Um, I guess we'll just have to dig into that a little bit more. Every, nobody really seems to know what the W means. So um, <laughs> we just have to get more of a handle on that. Um, OK, so just moving along, Tracy. Yeah, sure, go ahead. Yeah, um, so we snapped a picture of um, Southeast Street, um, the part of Southeast Street that's in between the Route 9 intersection and the Main Street intersection. Um, and, you know, just kind of showing what it looks like currently, just moving along. Yeah, okay, sorry. Yeah, thanks, Tracy. Yeah, that's good. Um, you know, uh, we've got some vegetation covering the, uh, you know, sadly, the kind of school zone flashers that go on between 8 and 8.20 in the morning, um, and that slows the speed to 20 during that time frame. Um, and then um, we're showing the kind of part of South Southeast Street that's closer to the Main Street intersection. So again, these are just sort of pictures to get everybody on the same page. Right. Um, and then the third right. page okay. is kind of, yeah, this would go through um, our observations about the sidewalks. Um, uh, Tracy was able to pull data that shows that this particular stretch of Southeast Street sees 7,000 cars. <laughs> the um, annual average daily traffic count on this section um, is Yeah, I actually think that this is from PAR now that I'm, it's like from, it was from the South, from the building study. I, I couldn't find that data from in the MassDOT database, but. Okay. So we got to get back. I'm just fixing it right now. Uh, yeah, and then just observing um, what the speed limits are. Um, the principals in particular are very concerned about speed on all the streets around their schools. So, I, you know, just getting us up to speed. Um, and then where the flashers are and where the sidewalks are. Yeah. I guess I like the idea of just calling them like flashing signs or something. Yeah. I don't know. And do you want me to actually do this as a whole presentation, Tracy, or just I I'm just it's up to you. I mean it's yeah, pretty I'm short. Just kind of cliff noting you're, you're through going this. through pretty unless, fast. Yeah. Yeah, unless folks think I mean, that I'll say one thing I like. I mean, just I mean, I've looked, you know, looked at these intersections a lot, but the one one thing I do like about the main street intersection. Um, is that, well, one, that's where the crossing guard for Fort River is posted, and two, um, one, there's more signs, there's more school zone signs there, uh, but then also for each, in each direction at that intersection, there's like no turn on red signs, um, which is yes. good, good in terms of pedestrian safety. Now, it did come up as an issue in terms of traffic flow at the elementary school building committee meeting. Um, and people are saying, well, having no turn on red means, you know, it really, it really constrains the traffic there. I mean, there are ways you could set the no turn on red signs to be like school. You could have like more interactive signs that like the no turn on red could only be if you like hit the pedestrian crossing button or something like that. So it wouldn't be all the time. And I've seen some intersections where that's been implemented and it, it, it seems like it works great, so long-term if the town wanted to change. I don't yeah, know how much those cost. Um, yeah, there, um, so I, the next section, um, yep, yep. Um, route nine. Nine, the actual Route 9 um, intersection, and then that's three pages long, and then the, fo the following section is the Main Street intersection. So, um, yeah, I mean, I think we want to be on the same page with the principals and the school about what is actually, what's the state of things right now, and then what are the improvements that they would like to see made. Um, sure. and try to allay, you know, it's like some of the principals will just say, oh, it's completely and totally unsafe. But, you know, that's actually not true. <laughs> especially when it comes to the main street, southeast street, northeast street intersection. So the hope is that these um, pictorial audits just help 
ground everybody in the reality of what is there already and then can ground everybody on the recommendations. Yeah, I think it would be nice here on in this one to add like a few slides with Pelham or just like Pelham Road. Do you have okay, Pelham yeah. Road on here? Just because I, it's so, um, narrow. it's such a bad road. <laughs> it's such a bad sidewalk. It's narrow and it's got mailboxes installed all over it. And some places are very narrow. Yeah. Um, one thing that was news to me at Fort River, which I hadn't been aware of, is that from Pelham Road, like over to the back of Fort River, there is like a path, um, which is behind nice. Pickering yeah, plumbing. which is what, yeah, yeah behind Pickering plumbing. Have, yeah, you already have the picture. Yeah, we do have it, but yeah. I'm saying until I was like on site, I didn't realize that. Oh, though, right, this, no. though the staff said it's not, you know, that well maintained and that it's not cleared in the winter and things like that. And the day we were there, we didn't see anybody on it. Um, but it's it is nice to have it. And um, where is that picture? Parents, parents from Echo Hill told me that it's um, it's this They're is a path the actually. Oh, so, so that's if you from yeah, Pelham it's from Pelham Road. If you're at the Pickering, I mean, I took some other pictures. If you're at the Pickering site, it, you just go to like the back, and it's a path. And so it's it's paved. It has lights. Yeah, yeah. Who um. Who owns the road? Who owns the footpath? I think it's the district. I don't know. I Guilford, think it's part of the know. school district. Guilford. Yeah. I mean, and it says that you don't like. See, there's these signs. Uh, I'm gonna stop sharing. I'm just gonna share like a couple pictures if I can pull it up. But um, it says that, like no no trespassing and stuff like that. So I assume it's a town school sign. It's, it's the it belongs. All the elementary schools belong to the town. Okay. That parcel is a school parcel for Fort Rivers, part of Fort Rivers parcel. So that so, means Fort River takes care of the maintenance. They should. Right. Yeah, I mean, um, I think the kind of key part of this document will be the end is the recommendation. Yeah. And Sorry, I think I'll, that's I'll when pull, I'll, we I'll want our observations and Deb, and you know, Tammy, who is the principal at Fort River right now, the interim principal, we want to all be on the same page, literally about what are the recommendations and what are, and some of them are gonna be probably pretty easy. Like let's clear the vegetation from in front of the school zone flashing light. Um, some of them are going to be um, a heavier lift and maybe a longer haul, but um, I think we all just want to have a sense of prioritization and what are the things that we actually want. And then in Tammy's case, we're really with all the principals. Their just knee jerk reaction is that everything is so unsafe that, you know, like it's just, why would we even ask kids to <laughs> walk and, you know, again, this is just an effort to get everybody um, in agreement about what the state of the situation is right now. And in Fort Rivers example, like the, the Main Street intersection is pretty darn safe. Um, and not shockingly, that's where the walkers and the bikers are coming from. And so, you know, if we can put in some effort in, an other, in a couple other places, maybe we can um, I mean, we've already gotten feedback from people walking from south of the Route 9 intersection coming up to the school that they feel unsafe at the Route 9 intersection. So, you know, what can we do to up the standard there and increase the perception of safety? Well, and Chris Fressup, right, you told us at one of the meetings that planning had applied for grant to improve the sidewalks to Colonial Village along, I guess it's, is it Route 9 and Southeast Street or just along Route 9? It's or, just along Route 9. Okay, so, and there there are sidewalks south of that intersection along Southeast yeah. Street and they end at Colonial Village too. Um, but, but they're um, they're in pretty good shape, the sidewalks. Yeah, no, they are, yeah. Yeah, it's, I think it's just the actual intersection itself is, you know, the crosswalks are faded. It doesn't have some of the other protections that you're talking about, like the no turn on red scenario, like the Main Street intersection does. And, and we heard that direct feedback from a couple of the families who live down there. And 
can bike. Well, and so. like somebody from Stanley Street, right? There's families on Stanley Street. Yeah, the family, um, they, they are a group of kids who walk or bike and it's Stanley Street and Colonial Village. So. Guilford has his hand up. So if, if, it, if the, everyone in your meeting that you had says Fort River is so dangerous, why did everyone in your meeting vote for Fort River to be the site of the school? <laughs> you know, I have to say- No, I mean, I didn't hear that. I didn't hear everybody at that meeting say that Fort River was so dangerous. I felt like- Why are we I doing heard, all this work? Yeah, Tammy definitely has the knee jerk, but again, is the interim principal not sure that I honestly, you know, compared to Nick at Wildwood and Derek at, um, you know, Crocker Farm, who have literally been principals for decades at these schools, Tammy is new. And um, her just general thing is that, um, yeah, she didn't think it was particularly safe. And so this document would, again, the goal of this document is for all of us just to understand the state of things now and then uh, pick and choose the well, kind of that we want. Well, and I mean, I didn't attend very many of the elementary school building committees, but I did attend some. And I also read some of those traffic reports, including the one that was like three, 400 pages with all the appendices of all the counts. I mean, the reality is that the school building committee, they looked at a number of criteria. They had a matrix for scoring and that the walkability was one factor, like the pedestrian safety was one factor of many factors. And so between the Wildwood and Fort River sites, the majority of committee members didn't see like a huge, huge difference between Fort River and Wildwood. I mean, some felt that Wildwood was safer, um, but not everybody did consistently. And so, I mean, there were many other factors, including just the disruption on the site and the one point of access at Wildwood and other things. I mean, you can go back and look at the matrix that they used, but so, so I wasn't one there. Thing, one thing that the, the building committee is doing and working on is they are going to probably do an intersection analysis of the whole intersection and bring a consultant in to do that. So it would be College Street, Southeast Street, Main Street and Southeast Street and the two driveways. So that is something the town's looking at doing. Yeah. Okay. Are you saying in kind of in concert with the timeline of the the new school or a sort of like as a separate thing or it's going to be with and it's going to be a separate thing in concert with the development of the school because the school building authority is not going to pay for any intersection improvements. We have to take money from other town projects or any any of the money we get for other grants um, to pay for any improvements of this these two intersections. Right. Or, or you could, I mean, with the Save Reach the School, I mean, this is the one reason I think the district might be interested is right that the Save Reach the School infrastructure program will like pay for intersection improvements if they're improving Save Reach the School, like that are up to two miles away from the school. Yes, and I probably mean, because you can make that argument that it's like related to like the school walkability and stuff. So correct, which is it would, which goes back to the other thing is that they voted for the school site, and the towns kind of said, you know, this was not the best choice, and we're not going to put a lot of road money into this site that's otherwise going to other stuff. So grants are going to be needed. Safe routes to school grant. Um, we're going to probably have wait, to go for Wait, wait, Gilford, can you repeat what you just said? I didn't understand that. Um, the, the town has said that we're not going to spend that much town money to improve these intersections. Um, so grants will be needed. We're going to have to go to Safe Routes to School, a Mass Works grant, or actually it's called One Stop Grants now. Those things will probably have to be done. And, and a lot of the work will probably fall to will fall to the committee people who are willing to work with the schools to get it, those applications in. The town won't put the money in because the town disagrees with the site location or because? We have other priorities and to fix something that's gonna cost more than it should cost if you had gone to the other school site, it's not really, they're not gonna 
give any more money just because you chose a site that has the biggest cost for improvements. Okay. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I, I don't. Mean that, that's I don't sort. Of, I mean, that's that. sort of beyond like the tax scope. <laughs> no, no. I but mean, I'm just no, saying. No, no, no. I understand. Of course, to, it's like. I think you're going the, the right. You're going the right direction than trying to push forward to all these safe routes to school and all these other things. Right. That money is going to be needed to make this right. site safer because I don't think there's going to be any extra anything beyond what was already kind of scope for these areas to go there. Okay, good. All right. Yeah, and I mean, just to set everybody's expectations, I'm definitely not anticipating the district applying for any grants like in the next six months. I think there's still a lot of education, <clears throat> a lot of the district principals, including the principal, the district management, including the principals, everybody just needs to be on the same page about the sites and about what's wanted, where the parent volunteers are going to make the biggest impact. And currently that's not the case. And so these documents are, an, uh, and Tracy's documents are efforts to try to get to that place with the district management. Right. And the reality too is like, what I understood with that traffic analysis of that intersection is that it is already, you know, one of the most congested, challenging intersections in Amherst, right? And that's even before the school population is expanded in the vicinity. So, I mean, you can make a case for like improving it. I mean, that that corridor typically, like pre-COVID, I just remember the College Street corridor from like Southeast Street into town it's like it's one of those corridors that it will take you, you know, 10, 15 minutes or longer to go like a mile. You know, it's just it's a bad corridor in terms of the congestion, especially UMass related congestion. But Chris has your so, hand. Oh, yeah. So do, am I muted? No. Um, so there are a lot of moving parts here because we have the school that is being renovated and we also have. East Street School that's going to be renovated and units are going to be added there. And we also have property that we've acquired on Belchertown Road that's a little bit east of the old Sunoco station that's going to be renovated to um, provide more housing. Mm -hmm. So I think yeah. there's a total of like, I don't know, 60 or 70 housing units that are going to be added there. So that's going to be add, adding to the traffic and adding to the pedestrians and adding to the children who are coming to the school. So it really has to be kind of thought of as a whole package. And, you know, what you're doing now is like an in, incremental step towards making the area safer. But in the long run, it's going to have to be, you know, a bigger, a bigger look. And I think Guilford is talking about hiring you know the consultant that usually works with us which i think is cdm more um to an analyze that whole stretch of southeast street and the intersections and figure out you know what's the best way of improving that area and sure. the planning department and the dpw always work together to um you know get grants and when you know grant opportunities come up we're, right now we're looking at getting community development block grant money for some things. And we're also, um, we always have an eye out for um, infrastructure projects. So, you know, when Mass Works or One Stop opens up in the winter, maybe we'll know enough about what improvements we want here so we could apply for some money to mm -hmm. do something here. So it's, I guess all I'm saying is there's a lot happening here and we need to kind of think about it all together and not just be like looking at um smaller details but no i i mean so ours we were doing it in the context of safe routes to school and trying to relaunch it with the schools i mean it could lead up to one of the safer to school grants mm -hmm. um but it seemed that i mean given the very small i mean and i can kind of go through what i presented you know what i had put together too but given the very small numbers of students who currently walk and bike to school I mean, traditionally, like pre-COVID, there were more, um, you know, people are, what we've heard from the school facilities and transportation people is that many students are still not back to riding the bus. Like there are a lot more um, parents still driving because during COVID, the district really said, if you can drive your own kids, please do, and please don't take the bus for COVID. 
you know, we don't have a lot of bus staffing. We don't want to have to run more and more buses. And so that still is lingering a little bit. Um, and that, I mean, I understand, you know, historically there were some like Wildwood or other places, there were some pretty big numbers of kids walking, biking to school, but it's really not there anymore. So what we were doing is we were just, you know, providing an overall, you know, we did the counts and we looked overall at the conditions and then moving forward, I mean, of course the district would have to work with the town on infrastructure improvements and so on, but it seems that just with the numbers so low currently of who's walking to school, like that you really, a lot of it also is just about, you know, doing promotional activities and things to try to encourage some of it. And I mean, the middle school and high school, they have committees that are, I mean, student led in initiatives about climate change and things and just trying to tie in into that if people think it's safe enough to do. Right. I mean, there is a certain um, for most of the school. I mean, there is a certain perception, even at places like Wildwood and stuff, that it's not that safe. I mean, you know. So, I mean, this is just a baseline, and really, from this point on, I mean, we're. I mean, if TAC, I mean, if TAC is asked to get involved on some of like the infrastructure pieces, um, but it would really be the district collaborating with the town. And from this point on, we just wanted to say, like, these are the baseline conditions of what stuff is now. And then and then from I mean, I mean, I can't really speak for Christine, but what I, my understanding is just working, you know, on education and stuff like with students at the schools and kind of doing that, those type of activities and maybe doing like if we can collaborate with like the police department too about like speed enforcement or something like that, because at every single school, we heard that the speeds are an issue, right? And that, so, okay. Okay. I mean, even at Crocker Farm, like we are hearing that even when the school buses are like trying to turn left out of the driveway and things that they're getting honked at because cars have to slow down and things. So, I mean, there's this culture that people have to go faster and faster. And so um, just maybe addressing some of that, but. Sorry, just a quick, in, yeah. sorry, I have to yeah. leave, unfortunately. Okay. So I will see you guys next time. Sure. Thank you. Bye, Thanks. Marcus. Bye, Marcus. Okay. Christine, did you want to comment? Yeah, I just um, I see the, um, the principals wanting to make some modest improvements now. And I think, um, I mean, that's good feedback. I think Fort River in particular needs to keep the long view, but also, you know, there are going to be some suggestions about, um, you know, removing vegetation um, and cleaning debris, um, you know, potentially putting up some more school zone, zone signs. I think it's all stuff that's not going to, um, um, that I think we can do to enhance safety now or the perception of safety now that um, isn't going to be um, out of sync or somehow stymie um, a good thorough long-term plan. Yeah. That makes sense. So I can go ahead and like kind of just overview what I put together and see, I would, it would be helpful. I think before we take it to the principals to have like an endorsement from TAC and and we don't really, this doesn't need to be like the Chris and Tracy show if anybody else has like comments or things like that. I mean, does this seem like a good activity for TAC to be doing any feedback? And, and Bruce came to our subcommittee meeting, so. No, I, I think it's it's excellent you've done this work and thank you. And uh, I think considering there is gonna be a new school at that particular site, this is, this is extremely timely. Yeah, and certainly also I, I I concur. I mean, my real hesitation with the location of that school, with the school was the location and all of the limited times I have to go there and how um, I, I can see that it's not a very, I, I'm not sure I would feel safe sending my kids walking, you know, across those intersections as well. Um, but it's also important to remember that, I mean, I, the, you know, all the schools are going to be used for at least the next couple of years, right? So, um, you know, all of the school, I, I'm thinking about Wildwood too. I mean, it's still right. going to be in use for the next couple of years. So, you know, any improvements we can do to any of yeah. these 
school. Well, and I mean, in Crocker walking. Farm, right? I mean, uh -huh. yeah. I mean, Derek Shea is always concerned about safety at Crocker Farm and so on. Yeah. So, so as I said, um, we had talked about this and we were working at this at the subcommittee meeting. And we got feedback from Bruce and Guilford. And um, so I can just kind of walk through it and I can send it out if people want to like look at it more thoroughly. I apologize for not sending it out much before the meeting. Um, so this is the sum of, I mean, it does overlap with what Chris was just presenting. Um, you know, overall, so what we were doing here is we were just trying to do like a baseline conditions report as part of this Safe Reach to School initiative with the schools to help kick it off, um, right? So our overall findings were just that there really aren't that many students walking or biking to school. Um, you know, it's interesting that consultant for the elementary school building study, they had done um, walking counts um, in the winter and basically the counts like in the spring and like good weather are almost the same and it's very close to like 10 students 15 students at most the only school that had more students walking is crocker farm because one there's an apartment complex right. or the condos like the jeffrey amherst apartments that are right next to the school driveway and there's also the neighborhood with mount holyoke drive and there's mm -hmm. a path literally from that neighborhood like to the school and that's the only school that has housing that close and it's reflected because the school buses don't come down there and so on and so we did find i mean we are still trying to clarify with the w's but it seems that the current district practice is even for students who live within a mile and a half and in you know in olden times would be asked to walk to school um they really aren't being asked to do that anymore if the school bus is still going by them like along on their route to school and the school bus will, would still pick them up. And um, so the days when they would say like entire areas had to walk to school is not, I don't think happening as much, but we are still trying to get some clarification from that. So, so the overall, right, there were a few students walking or biking to school and we found some strengths and weaknesses. I mean, again, you know, when you hear some of the people talk about how you know dangerous it is to walk or bike to some of these schools, it I don't think it reflects that we do have some infrastructure that in certain other places like they wouldn't even have sidewalks or they wouldn't even have like anything and so even though our sidewalks could be better our crosswalks could be better the intersections could be better like it's not like we don't have anything and I, what i was hearing is that one of the main concerns is the speed right so all the way from like route nine on route nine all the way from the intersection we're talking about like all the way out to rolling green and things there's a sidewalk um you know is the sidewalk as well maintained as it could be no you know is the traffic but really the main concern there is that do you want kids to walk next to a road that's like got such busy traffic even if they don't have to cross it and at what age would parents feel comfortable having their kids do that um so you know so overall we are saying that you know basically there are sidewalks or off-road pedestrian paths for the most common to school routes at each of the elementary schools you know, the main intersections have crosswalks and they have the traffic lights with pedestrian crossing signals, which is something we didn't see that like Pomeroy Lane, for example, mm -hmm. right? That's a place where people are crossing. It doesn't even have a pedestrian crossing signal at all. So it's really great that that's being redesigned. And, you know, and they do have school zone signs at each um, school and the reduced speed limit signs and things like that. Um, in terms of areas for improvement, and feel free to like raise your hand if you have any additional comments. Um, again, the traffic speed that was mentioned consistently, you know, and that there are safety concerns with students crossing specific streets and intersections. So of course, so Fort River, we were just talking about it, right? That the main intersection, challenging intersection is the Route 9 intersection. And then also just the Pelham Road and the sidewalk is so bad. Um, at Wildwood, I mean, to me, a safety issue at Wildwood is just a crosswalk at East Pleasant and Strong. And at our subcommittee meeting, Bruce mentioned how he's almost been hit trying to cross there and that the crossing guard generally there for this limited time, you know, there's no flashing lights or anything. The cars coming from UMass are coming downhill. It is quite a few cars. So um, before COVID, it was up to like over 7,000 vehicles a day were going through that intersection. And there are another, you know, 3,000 cars on strong. And so um, it's a lot of cars. And, um, and I would love to see some more, something done there to make that crossing safer. Um, I know like Eve Vogel, she had mentioned how when her child wasn't, 
at Wildwood and she wanted him to self dismiss and cut, walk over to her office that the staff at the Wildwood office were always concerned about the safety of crossing at that intersection. I don't know, Kim, your, your kids went to Wildwood. Yeah, you but there's always Wildwood a, or? there. Yeah, they walked a lot and they rode their bikes, but there's always a crossing guard at that. At, okay. at the dismissal and, and entry times. So, but isn't it yeah. like sometimes the windows kind of narrow? I, I like, or that's what I've heard. I don't know. It is, but I mean, it's totally okay. I mean, maybe there's like a half an hour around the. I, I, I never, my kids I don't always know. have somebody there. Okay. So I felt like that was, I, I agree, it's not the safest crossing, but if one was to, you know, if a kid was trying to be doing right. that themselves, because they have to definitely negotiate with the cars who have to watch a car and make sure that it stops, right, which is sometimes above a, a child's ability, but sure. a guard there. It's a pretty well marked crossing area too. Well, there's good signs. Yeah, right. Um, I guess a question, Christine, and because, because Christine, her child will also cross over. Um, I've been under the impression that the crossing guards aren't there for half an hour, but maybe I'm wrong. Maybe we can get some clarification from the district about how long. I know. I think the crossing, the crossing guards are there. Um, the crossing guards know who to expect. Yeah, they do as well. Um, and that's and so that's important because they will stick around for my daughter. Okay, good. Nice. If she's a minute, if she's a couple of minutes late, but um, I do think that that intersection and. Bruce, maybe it's just something to bring up separately with the district four counselors, um, just for everybody's safety. That would be a good candidate to have one of uh, what are they called the RRFIs? Yeah, I agree yes. because you're right. It is kind of downhill and on yeah, like, it's, straight away. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, and then yeah. the and then not to jump the gun, but Crocker Farm. Um, right the west street section right in front of the school the speed limit on either side northbound and southbound is 40 miles an hour mm -hmm. and then the two school zone flashers are literally right at the driveway so drivers mm -hmm. speeding by at 40 suddenly have to slow down to 20. they have you know 50 yards 20 25 yards to do it um and then, uh, and then they're speeding back up again. And that's the case on both sides. Mm -hmm. uh, and so you can absolutely understand why a person with their kid, you know, walking over from that, sa that section, you know, Farmington Road or that whole area back behind Mission Camp. Orchard Valley. Yeah, like you just, yeah. you would not want your kid doing that. Um, it's just too scary. Well, and Derek Shea brought up when we were on site about the Pomeroy Lane intersection, which is why I put it on the agenda just to see yeah. if there any updates. Um, anyway, um, I'm yeah, I'm sorry for just I didn't. No, really that's fine. Yeah, totally change this topic to. Crop well, and the other thing that came up, the other thing that came up at Wildwood that the principal um, was concerned about is he was concerned about people from village, um, students from Village Park and families from Village Park who walk through the cemetery, and how they cross Strong Street because there isn't a crosswalk there. Oh, yeah, so they come out. There's no crosswalk. There's no sidewalk on that north side of the street. And then there are, there's no crosswalk for them yeah. either. You know, whether you can do improvements there. So if if there ever had been a roundabout there is what's being talked about, that would help with the pedestrian crossings. But I'm sure that's not in the cards anymore. Um, right. OK. Yeah, so just with Crocker Farm, like Crocker Farm, I know that they're always concerned about just the crossings, the various crossings along once the chain, which we've all talked about, you know, from Mill Lane and East Hadley Road and everything. Um, so we also found just, you know, summarizing what uh, Chris had brought up in her little slideshow about, you know, that just some sidewalks and paths could be better maintained, including like clearing in the winter, um, plowing materials post winter, being repaired, things like that. Um, we did, we did, I mean, I, I wasn't aware of this until Guilford had um, told us this at the subcommittee meeting, but it's actually the responsibility, just like it's a responsibility of the adjacent property owners to take care of snow removal on sidewalks. It's also the responsibility of adjacent property owners to clear things like sand and debris and things like that to keep the sidewalks clean. Um, and I have a feeling 
I mean, I've lived in Amherst a while and I didn't know that. Not that I have a sidewalk, maybe that's why. But I have a feeling that a lot of property owners don't really necessarily see that as their responsibility. They're like, oh, these are town sidewalks. They should be cleaning it or whatever. So maybe we could do a campaign on that. I do suggest that later on. Um, and just also, just as we were saying with the vegetation and particularly now at the end of the summer, there's a lot of signs, a lot of speed signs, a lot of signs you can't see. I did not feel comfortable at, at Fort River that that little bypass near the bank, that the stop sign is completely obscured now by vegetation and the crosswalk isn't even marked anymore. And even as a grown up, I was like, I didn't feel like I would feel comfortable crossing there, let alone any kind of kid heading towards Re9. Um, so, um, so just suggest the next steps you know, in terms of the infrastructure, just trimming the vegetation and doing some inventory about the signs. I mean, that came up too in that elementary school building study report, you know, that they had identified that some of them are consistent, you know, with the current engineering standards. Um, you know, identify cross beams and crosswalks near the schools that are in need of better marking, repainting, things like that. Um, doing some minor sidewalk improvements as possible. And then, you know, after these inventories are done, perhaps look at some of the smaller grant funding, like the signs and lines grant funding from Safe Routes to School to help pay for some upgrades, repairs, new signs, and so on. And um, again, and I'd really like to see, and maybe this isn't actually short term, but just snow removal. Um, because it's come up to that, like near some of the schools, sometimes some of the key paths or sidewalks that students would walk on, like that they're blocked up. We know when you have snow, like, for example, sometimes I guess the Wildwood driveway. I don't know, Kim, did your students walk, did your kids walk in the winter? But sometimes the plows with the Wildwood driveway will like block the sidewalk. Hmm. And then hmm. where are the students left to walk? I'm not sure how much that happens, but. Um, OK, and then just longer term, you know, it's it seems like one challenge is just overall just having maintenance for you know road infrastructure sidewalk infrastructure like all these great facilities that we're building where we're improving things that what's the maintenance budget look like and making sure and this kind of goes back to you know back when eve was on the committee and she sort of outlined some like annual things that should be done in terms of like repainting the bike lanes or repainting the crosswalks and things like that but the maintenance piece is important and I know that there are all so many competing budget priorities, but I'm hoping that we can have like renewed commitment to that. So, so Tracy, I'm, yeah. I'm wondering if with the safe routes to school, you know, with the schools being so invested, potentially, you know, they know where the issues are. Um, if there is money that can go to the schools to hire people to say, do things like clear snow from particular paths around the school, um, as opposed to putting it back on the town, you know, because schools know much more what needs to get done and when sure. it needs to get done, as opposed to the town who maybe has, you know, people who do sidewalks, but they get to it when they can. Right. You know, I mean, is, the there, so is there money for that? I mean, I don't know. I mean, when we are, I mean, this document that I'm preparing here is for the schools more mm -hmm. than the town. Um, but I don't know what the budgets look like on the school side. But I'm just saying, that. are the money, the grant money, could it go oh. to school? Who who does it go to? And is there like because because I hear this all the time, right? About about maintenance stuff, which is really I mean, unclear who yeah, does that. I know I agree with you. I mean, I don't know, Christine press it might have more information it seems to me that a lot of grants are set up like for the infrastructure like they're set up to build things they're not set up to Maintain. keep them going right and I think yeah. that's a challenge that we see in Hadley the challenge that right. makes me crazy that you have this beautiful sidewalk that no one takes responsibility for keeping it shoveled like right. on route nine between University Drive and the Hampshire Mall because right. or even state DOT says it's not them, you know, state DOT says it's not their job, the town says it's not their job, property owners say no, it's not, nobody, you know, so, I mean, this, the maintenance piece is always huge, so I don't know, that's not really a short-term thing to figure out maintenance, but, 
like long, you know, but they could be conversations. In yeah, in I don't know about the safe routes to school. And right. maybe that's something we can ask them, like say, you know, hey, come on. <laughs> it's not just building these things. It's maintaining these things. Right. Because that's the real issue. And maybe that's a good question for the state DOT too, right? The state DOT keeps funding all these things. I, I think, agree. Um, I have just to interject with my Wildwood experience, um, you know, in a snowy conditions, um, it is a challenge. So the maintenance guys are actually the crossing guards. So they have to hustle, you know, arrive early in a snowstorm and get out to East Pleasant and Strong to, um, you know, during the time frame that the kids are arriving. Um, and then if they have time, they're the ones who are shoveling off the section of strong right. sidewalk. Right. But the pl town plows go by and throw yeah. the snow back onto the sidewalk. Yeah. It's just this whole like thing where the, you know, the maintenance guy who's also the crossing guard can't be doing maintenance while he's also doing the crossing guard duty and it's to shepherd the kids who are walking in the road at this point um down and there's, the, a, and there's a lot to the shovel that they, yeah despite the fact that he already shoveled on his way up no i know. You know to the um to the intersection so it does get dicey and i'm not sure that there are easy solutions um you know to those to to that type of situation um i think uh you know right trying, trying to have more cross i know in i think more crossing guards or being able to boost the, the numbers of maintenance guys who are out and about on snowy days might be a good, um, you know, right. to talk about just as an internal discussion. Right, with, but, yeah. but I guess what I'm saying is I like, I appreciate those hurdles, but at the same time, if the schools had discretionary money be for these kinds of things, mm, like right. cleaning sidewalks, even, you know, brushing off the sand after, you know, after the winter, as well as shoveling, it might, you know, you could hire someone on a temporary basis. It doesn't, you know, you could hire some high schoolers to do this. I don't know, but, you know, if the schools had more power to you, to, to do the kind of thing, because I don't think it's a town thing because the town doesn't have the same you know, doesn't have the same understanding that the schools do. I'm just wondering if that might be. No, I know. And I mean, the staffing, it is interesting to me. Yes. It is interesting to me that Amherst uses its like custodians to be the like, crossing guards. Because they I've been, to be I've been everything. Looking, the customers I mean, are, as far I, as I can tell, do everything. You know, the school bus I, drivers also deliver the mail and do, you I know. Just, um, because if you look at a lot of other communities, including Western Mass, like they hire crossing guards and their one and only job is to be the right. crossing guards right. and to, but these guys, especially as Chris is saying, like in a winter condition, I mean, they have a lot of area at the schools to clear, like aside from, you know, you have the main driveway and the parking areas, but you have like the playground, you have so much to do. And it's challenging. It's definitely very challenging. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, maybe, I don't know how much flexibility is in the school budgets. I mean, that's something we can bring up, right? Yeah. But it wouldn't be the one, I, so I guess what I'm asking yeah. is if we're roots to school, if we could actually give money to the schools to do things right. like maintenance so that they have the ability to take care of the things that they know. And I'm just wondering, you know, right. it might not exist right now, but maybe that's something we should ask for because- Well, why don't we, Um. yeah, I mean, that can be a discussion you know, with the yeah. safer school contact, we can contact her. Um, and that can also be something that comes up when Chris and she and Lucy meet with the district too. I don't know. Um, I mean, yeah. I mean, the town staff and the school, I mean, everybody, all the staff work really hard. No, I'm not no. sure, you know, and um, I know that like Derek Shea, one idea he had is he was looking at the model um, with crossing guards that's used in the UK, where you actually, the government, like the state government there, or the provincial government, whatever, they pay for the crossing guards. Hmm. It's not decided like a district by district level. They're actually like employees of the larger government. 
Cool. And because it's an initiative and they have crossing guards like at every, you know, main intersection and stuff. So, yeah. Those are good questions. Okay. And then, um, yeah, so then just longer term, you know, just trying to find things to really do like traffic calming and other stuff like that. And then, and this is, and the last part here was just, you know, creating the climate to encourage more students to walk, bike, and roll to school you know, having events, like that's the kind of stuff that we've been talking to the district about. And also, you know, where we would need PGOs or other volunteers to get engaged and and do some of that and see, you know, if the if Phil Laramie or some other officer from the Amherst PD is available to do some of the stuff or, you know, if there could be more um, police department, speed enforcement, and um, and also more crossing guard staffing. I mean, maybe even some volunteers would be willing to do it. You know, if you do it as an extended thing with this thing where we're talking about like walking Wednesdays, you know, maybe getting some parents to sign up to help. And I mean, it's tricky with volunteers because you want you want volunteers who you know will be there, right? You don't want parents to assume that they're going to be a crossing guard and then because it's a volunteer, they're not there or something. I don't know. But so those are sort of our main takeaways which is more than our main ideas, which is more than we've had in the past, you know, because I was trying to connect with the district on safe routes to school for a few years and I got nowhere and Chris got, got in and she got Deb Westmoreland interested and the principals are interested now too. Yeah, that's great. Well, they don't want it on their plate. They want other people to do it. <laughs> like so because of course i don't, know, so I don't know if that's true i know i i think they're just busy everybody's busy yeah, yeah and once presented with the evidence right so yeah. they're just they're reasonable people and it's like oh yeah, yeah of course when's the last time anybody asked if the path to pelham road was cleaned off and right. you know is that a priority or not like it just yeah. I, it's it's re everybody is really making an effort to revisit all of this. And I think sure. it's, I'm not sure <laughs> we're expecting no. an, an infrastructure overhaul in the next year, but you know, the conversation is getting started and hopefully priorities will coalesce and yeah, we'll get involved. And, and, and it was great. I mean, even getting all the principals in the room together and talking about it and things. So yeah, yeah. that's a real, that's a coup <laughs> right there. Good job. So yeah. Okay. Great. And well, then um, I'm, I'm just, I would like to take credit, but it's, I mean, I literally just asked Deb and she was just like, oh my God. Yeah. I mean, and it is, does seem like it's something that Mike Morris and Debbie are truly interested in, you know, so. making happen. So Good. Cool. here we are. Yeah. Hey, so um, Guilford, I did have just a data question for you. Do we have traffic counts on 116? Do you have like town traffic counts for eight? No. We, we use the ones that uh, Pioneer Valley Planning Commission does every oh, year. OK, all right. We use those. Okay. They, they were just out in town doing counts recently. Also, because won't weren't there must have been were there some counts with like Pomeroy too? Or I know that was during COVID, but okay. There were counts. There were some old counts done as well, and then they, were, they did some extrapolation. Okay. So, are those traffic counts? Are they available um, on the town website? Are they available through the Pioneer Valley Planning Commission? Where do you, where can so the ones the Pioneer Valley Planning Commission has, you can get from them directly. Okay. And the ones the town have, you have to ask and we have to dig them out right. somewhere. Is there, but is there a list of like where they've been done or? No. There is not. Okay. All right. So what do you got? Does anybody have? So um, Chris and Lucy are going to meet with the district next week and you know present some of this information. If if anybody has any other comments, if not, we we are you know, we only have twenty minutes left in the meeting, and uh, it looks like we lost Tate. And uh, but we can cover the last couple items too on the agenda <laughs> before. Oh, that's too great. So okay. All right. So our, our next agenda item is uh, uh, some continuing 
Yeah, just a couple continuing items. I didn't know, um, Guilford, if you had any updates um, about this, trying to do this um, bicycle pedestrian networks map. Yeah, it's, it's just in the back burner. She she uh, gave me a proposal and we just haven't got kind of finalized to get her okay. on board. So I did hear from her, you know, she is a grad student who's doing the dual program with regional planning and landscape architecture. I think, no, I guess, sorry, geography and planning or something. She did just move to, to Greenfield, but she, she sounded pretty busy. She didn't know how much time she would have. Mm. So um, it would be great, I think, as, you know, with not just with Safe Richardson School, but some of these other things too, like once we can have that map, like a, an updated version of the map available. So just when we're having conversations about like, you know, these are main, you know, pedestrian corridors and things like that to try to use those, I guess, as, as it sounds like the town is gonna be looking for money and looking for priorities and things like that. So, I mean, so. Um, and then are there any updates about Pomeroy Village? Went out to bid. Okay. Woo. Yay. And so how long is like it usually the bid usually open and then how long does it take to? We'll probably get bids back at the end of the month. And okay. Hopefully get started except for um, bring into lots of material issues and oh, our other sure. projects. Okay. It doesn't seem like the construction of the project is going to happen in um, in like this year, like this calendar year, or I don't know. Okay, I didn't know. We'll we should start, be able to start, but oh right, we're not gonna we're not gonna wrap How, up. When, this year. when do you usually like with winter and stuff? When do you, is there like a time frame when you usually stop? infrastructure projects or do you just keep going until sorry we, I don't know <laughs> we, we normally stop all road work around Thanksgiving oh oh that late wow yeah once once I mean it kind of depends on whether the farmer's almanac is correct or Noah's right um if the farmer's <laughs> almanac is correct it's gonna be really cold this year so it may be stopped sooner if Noah's right then we may go they may go longer I mean they were some of the asphalt plants were open into um, January last year. What? Oh my God. Yeah. Well, doesn't it seem like the last few winters is that like sometimes De December is pretty mild and then it's only in like, we don't actually get, a, I don't know, we don't get a lot of snow actually until like January, February. It's yeah. Not, it seems that lately, but, but I'm not out trying to build infrastructure when it's getting cold, so. Okay. And um and then somebody which is asking me too just about like Kendrick Park and I know the council had approved to just do some of those interim changes, like change the parking signs to the other side of the street and things like that. Yeah, we have like four more weeks, right? Before the students get here, right? Yeah. The students school starts after Labor Day. Yeah. On the we fifth. Have three, we have four weeks. Nobody's parking there now. I mean, no the, the main people I see parking there are actually families that are going to the park, right? And then because there's no parking on the park side, they're parking across the street and then letting their kids out and the kids are going across the street, which yeah. currently it's quiet, but that won't be the case come Labor Day or whenever. So. I did see a nice, uh, I think there was a light and a, maybe a crosswalk between um, the park the where the sidewalk comes out and the Mexican restaurant. Am I right about that? I, yeah, I, we, call it the Gar Garcia's. we call it the Garcia's car house Garcia's. walk. Yeah, that was cool. Oh, is that in now? There's the a Garcia's? big no. light there too. Oh. It's going in. But now there's currently a crosswalk like closer to like the Valley Bike Station, right on the Kendrick. Are they going to have? Yeah, are both the, cross, the are both crosswalks going to stay there, or is there only going to be the one? Because they're they're pretty close together now. Uh, there's there's going to be there's four crosswalks now to get oh, to Kendrick okay. Park. There's one at, Pre, at Triangle Street. There's one at Garcia's. There's one at Prey Street, and there's one at um, wow. Well, basically Halleck, where Halleck comes in. 
Okay. That's a lot. Okay. Well, that's good. Yeah. Well, see, and I did notice that one of the houses on that section, North Pleasant Street, they just built like a huge, they filled up some of their parking lot in the back of the building. Two of them, um, I think, did, actually. Oh, two of them did? Yep. So. Yeah. That will put a little more demand, I think, for their right. people to park on street and not in the back. <laughs> yeah. So, okay. Thanks. <clears throat> um, so that looks like all of those are items that have been updated. And our next is um, the next tax meeting, tech TAC meeting and other agenda items for that. Yeah. Meeting. So um, right. So it doesn't seem like we have anything to do on the 18th. Um, there is the TSO meeting on the 18th. And Kim, if that works out for you to go, yeah, that would be great. I should be able to do that. Yep. And we could ask them just to put it up like on front on the agenda and get it over with. Um, yep. And then in September, so we typically meet on the first and the third Thursdays, which it sounds mm -hmm. like that's been working for people and we can keep it at 5.30. Yep. People like that later time. Um, the question is whether do we want to meet on September 1st or do we want to wait until wait. after Labor Day too? Wait. <laughs> so. Okay. I can't imagine there'll be <laughs> other pressing. You know, we're going to be able to stay hybrid through. Do you remember? I don't remember what the legislature. It's pretty long now, Guilford, isn't through it? Through like March. Uh, oh, great. March mm. next year. Yeah. Okay. So tentatively, do we want to say that we think we might want to do maybe a meeting on the 8th? And yeah. then we could do a short meeting on the 15th or something. That sounds good to me. Um, the TSO is planning, so they are, TSO is planning to meet on September 15th to have the public hearing then, and then to also have on the 22nd to have a follow-up meeting if they had anything left over from the public hearing that they wanted to cover. Then I know that the TSO, they weren't gonna meet after that until like mid-October or something. But um, hmm. so why don't we can plan on just, a regular meeting on the 8th, yep. you know, we'll see what we have to cover. Maybe it will just be a short meeting. Then we can also have a short meeting on the 15th. Okay. If needed. So that sounds good. Okay, great. Um, Does anybody else have any updates or anything or? Can we move to adjourn? Yes, we can. Bruce, I excellent. Second. Thank you. All right. Take care, Thanks, everyone. Everybody. All right. Enjoy your August. August. Right. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.